I'm Michael Barr. I'm the Joan and Sanford Weill Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It is my uh, great honor and pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to welcome you to the Ford School for this uh, really uh, fantastic uh, conversation. Today's policy talks at the Ford School event is hosted by the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, known as CLOSEUP. Welcome as well to our online viewers and our thanks to Detroit Public Television, WTVS, for their partnership in making today's event available to voters throughout the state of Michigan. Our state faces a big day in just under a month. Among the important issues Michigan voters will decide on November 6th are two key ballot initiatives. One proposal addresses uh, who essentially draws and how our congressional districts are drawn, and another one would amend the state constitution around voting eligibility and other requirements. To help us better understand the pros and the cons of these proposals, Ford School Emeritus Professor John Chamberlain has assembled today's expert panel. I'd like you just to start by helping me thank John for making this happen. Full bios for our speakers are in your printed program, and John is going to say uh, a bit more about each one of them in just a moment. So uh, please just join me for now in welcoming Nancy Wang, Sharon Dolente, Richard McClellan, and Christopher Thomas. We're going to follow our usual Ford School um, format. Um, after John uh, and the panelists um, do their work together, we're going to open it up uh, to the audience. And the way you ask questions is by writing your questions on a note card. Uh, there'll be a staff member coming around to pick them up. Uh, they'll bring them to the front. And we have a wonderful student team who's going to sort through them and make sure that they um, uh, get asked uh, here to this terrific panel. Um, Close-up program manager Tom Avanco is going to help um, uh, the Ford School students uh, do that. Um, if you are um, watching uh, or listening online, you can also send your questions in uh, via Twitter um, with a hashtag PolicyTalks. Uh, with that, let me um, turn things over to John and um, ask him to come up to the podium and uh, uh, really look forward to the event we're going to have today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Barr, and welcome to our audience here in Annenberg Auditorium and to those of you watching the live streams of today's event, either on Detroit Public TV or on the Ford School website. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and thank supporters and sponsors of today's policy talk at the Ford School. The Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy in the Ford School, the Department of Political Science at the College of LSNA, the U of M Alumni Association, the U of M Student Group, We Listen, and the Ford School Student Group, the Domestic Policy Corps, and the League of Women Voters of the Ann Arbor area. Today's panel is entitled Electoral Reform via Ballot Initiatives. As most <coughs> of you already know, citizens of Michigan can place before voters proposed amendments to the Michigan Constitution. To do so, they must gather at least 350,000 valid signatures on petitions. They were dis discussing two such proposals that will appear on the November 6th ballot. Proposal 2 will, if approved by voters, amend the Constitution to provide for an independent redistricting commission that will be responsible for drawing new congressional and state legislative districts following each decennial census. Proposal 3 will, if approved by voters, amend the Constitution to make voter registration and voting easier for citizens, including automatic and election day registration, no reason absentee ballots, and the option of straight ticket voting. Your program contains the ballot wording for each of these proposals. In addition, there are several handouts that provide additional information that uh, was available as you came in. And now the requisite uh, request that you check your cell phones and turn them off uh, so that we can uh, proceed uninterrupted by phone calls. 
I'd now like to introduce our panelists. Uh, to my direct left is Richard McClellan, uh, a graduate of Michigan State and Michigan Law School, who's practiced law in Michigan for nearly 50 years, or maybe 50 years and a little bit. 50, yeah. He's uh, served in advisory capacities to Michigan, Gov Michigan Governors Milliken, Engler, and Snyder. And his legal practice has included extensive representation of political candidates, political action committees, ballot question campaigns, super PACs, and 401c4 organizations. He's going to share his reasons for believing that Proposal 2 is not good for Michigan and also offer some comments about Proposal 3. Next to him is Nancy Wang, the board chair for Voters Not Politicians, the group that spearheaded the drive to place Proposal 2 on the ballot. Nancy graduated from the College of Engineering at U of M and the Michigan Law School, practiced environmental law, and she's going to argue in favor of Proposal 2. Next to her is Sharon Delente, the voting rights strategist for the ACLU of Michigan, one of the lead partners in the Promote the Vote drive that was backed by more than a dozen organizations and that led to Proposal 3 being on the ballot. Sherrod is a graduate of the Ford School and the Michigan Law School and will argue in favor of Proposal 3. And on the far end, Christopher Thomas is the former elections director of uh, the state of Michigan, a post he held for 36 years. He graduated from MSU and the Thomas Cooley School of Law. He was twice elected president of the National Association of State Election Directors and in 2012 received that association's Distinguished Service Award. In 2013, he was appointed by Pre President Barack Obama to the Presidential Commission on Election Administration. And Chris will offer comments on both of these proposals that we're talking about today. Now that you know a bit more about today's panelists, let's begin with Nancy Wang. Thank you so much. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to just take a quick survey to see how many people in the audience know, um, have heard about Voters Not Politicians before today. I see a lot of familiar faces. Okay, great. Um, I'd just like to thank the Ford School and Close Up uh, for this opportunity. Our research shows that um, our biggest <coughs> challenge now, 29 days before Election Day, is not uh, the policy, um, but rather just people knowing about it. So I really, really welcome and appreciate this opportunity to talk about Proposal 2. Um, as John mentioned, I am the board chair of Voters Not Politicians. We are a group of ordinary uh, citizens who got together um, and responded to a Facebook post um, that our founder, Katie Fahey, um, put up in November of 2016. So I've been volunteering, um, I and 4,000 other uh, Michiganders have been volunteering for Voters Not Politicians now. Um, and I'm still a volunteer. Uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to get together. Um, we knew that gerrymandering was a huge problem in Michigan. It's one of the worst gerrymandered states in the country. Um, and we wanted to find a nonpartisan solution that would work for voters, not politicians, hence our name. Uh, and you might have uh, heard a little bit about um, our activities when we were out collecting petition signatures. We were able to collect 428,000 signatures in just over 100 days. Um, from all 83 counties, um, and it was all done by volunteers, um, which is incredible, but also it was out of necessity because we are completely grassroots and self-funded, and so, um, but it worked out really well. Um, and now we have a proposal on the ballot. Um, so the problem, I'll, I'll start with the problem. Um, like I said, Michigan is one of the top three uh, most gerrymandered states in the country. And it's not uh, a group that we want to you know, <laughs> be a part of. Um, you guys might have heard of Gil v. Whitford, which went up to the uh, US Supreme Court this past term. Uh, that is a case that ch challenged uh, Wisconsin's uh, district maps on the basis of partisan bias. Um, Michigan's maps are actually more biased than Wisconsin's. Um, and the, the process of how it works here in Michigan is that our legislators, um, the state legislature gets to draw its own maps uh, for its own election districts. So, you know, the state reps and state senators, um, they get to draw the maps for their own districts as well as the congressional districts. Um, obviously, that's a huge conflict of interest. Um, if they draw the maps one way, um, they can basically guarantee 
uh, uh, that the district will be a safe Republican or a safe Democratic district. And the reason they can do that is because of the, the vast amount of data that's available today. Um, you know, you're not just your voting history, but your income and even, you know, Facebook and all of that um, is available, as well as uh, really sophisticated computer programs and really fast computers that can draw, you know, tens of thousands of maps uh, in the space of a minute. And so what, what uh, the legislature has been doing, and um, you don't have to take my word for it, I'm really appreciative of the, um, the media, actually, in the state has been covering um, gerrymandering Michigan really, really well. And so, um, for example, uh, Bridge Magazine has put out uh, a bunch of articles that have really gone in depth in, in, in what, you know, examining what the problem is. Um, and I've asked uh, the Ford School to attach uh, one of their articles as part of this packet that's available to you. Um, and, um, you know, there's what the evidence shows, there's emails, there's witness testimony now, uh, because uh, the League of Women Voters is a plaintiff in a case, and they're challenging Michigan's maps, just like that Wisconsin case. And um, they've uncovered all of these emails that show exactly uh, you know, why Michigan's maps are so skewed. And it's because uh, the Republican Party, which happens to be in power right now, and they control the map drawing process in 2011, they gave a million dollars to a group um, that has no staff, uh, has no offices, just a P.O. box. Um, that group paid consultants uh, to sit in a dark, you know, in a, I don't know about dark, but um, to sit in secret and draw maps that uh, favor the Republican Party as much as possible. And there's emails that say, okay, you know, this is great. We have a strong um, nine to five um, result and that'll endure from 2012 and beyond. Uh, nine to five is the number of um, congressional, Republican congressional uh, representatives. So we in Michigan have 14 congressional representatives uh, that we send to DC. Nine of them are Republican and five of them are Democrat. And this is um, despite the fact that in 2012, 2014, and 2016, um, in the federal races, the Republican uh, candidates actually won less than 50% of the vote from Michigan voters. Um, so why this matters? Uh, it matters because uh, the politicians are picking their voters, not the other way around. Um, these maps are so, they're drawn so um, well, I guess you could say, that um, it enshrines, a, it, you know, it embeds a um, party advantage, again, despite election outcomes. So there's nothing, that, you know, there's nothing the voters can do. So that's something, you know, an argument that we hear a lot. Well, you know, to the victors go the spoils, and if people really cared, then they would just vote these politicians out. And that is exactly the problem. Because these uh, maps are so gerrymandered, we can't vote the politicians out. Uh, you know, you're hearing things about a blue wave coming maybe in 2018. Uh, it would take a tsunami, so, you know, one in a million year maybe uh, event for, for mil I don't know, a, a large, large portion of the electorate to, to sh shift parties. Um, for, for these politicians to be unseated. Um, so what we see in elections is we see, you know, a lot of ch uh, races go uncontested, right? Or maybe, you know, the primaries, are, that's the race that, that, that matters. Um, we have politicians who are unaccountable to us. Um, no seats change hands between the parties. Um, and again, all of this is uh, very well documented. So, um, voters not politicians, uh, proposal two, um, we seek to take the power of redistricting out of the politicians' hands and put it into the voters' hands. This is not a new idea, uh, even in Michigan. So right now in our 1963 constitution, there is an, there is a um, independent redistricting commission that's written, uh, and it actually um, operated for three uh, redistricting cycles. Um, it, Unfortunately, it was um, ruled uh, unconstitutional because it, this is kind of getting a little bit into the weeds, but um, it was allowed to draw districts that had different numbers of people in, in it, and the federal constitution um, requires that you have districts that have equal population. So that's the reason that that um, 
uh, commission no longer operates. It's been ruled unconstitutional. So what we would do actually is we would take away those constitutional infirmities. We would reestablish an independent redistricting uh, citizens commission in Michigan um, uh, to draw the district lines. So um, what we are, uh, the proposal, and um, I encourage everyone to please, you know, if you have any questions, there are a lot of volunteers actually from Voter Voters Not Politicians right in the audience, and they would be happy, happy to answer them, me as well. Um, but the proposal, um, what it does is it takes the fundamental problem with politicians drawing their own lines uh, out. Um, so politicians, you can put safeguards in there, but it's, it's the fox guarding the hen house, right? It's, it's, it's too much at stake, their own livelihoods at stake, uh, their own careers and the, um, the, um, their parties um, that, that hinge on whether they make the decision to draw this district you know, around this community or if they break that into four <coughs> different parts so that they can get four you know, really safe districts. Um, and so what this proposal does is it takes the politicians out of the redistricting business. Um, again, framers of our 1963 constitution recognize that this is the better way to go. Um, that commission was also a citizens commission. Six other states have citizens commissions are operating already. <coughs> Um, and what the research shows is that, unsurprisingly, commission-drawn districts are more fair, they're more impartial, and a hallmark of our proposal is that everything would be transparent. So everything the commission does, from the selection process, how they're selected, the names in the hat, who got removed, um, all of that would be made public. All of the deliberations of the commission would be, would be public, they could only um, meet they would only be able to do business in open meetings. Um, their, their, um, you know, the maps that they uh, seek to adopt, they'd have to go around the state and have um, ten, at least ten public hearings to show the public, um, you know, what they're considering and to get input from the public. And they have to accept also, you know, maps that are drawn uh, by the public. Um, and, and they would get public testimony about, okay, you know, do these communities, do these districts actually make sense or not? Do they, are these actual communities um, in the real world as opposed to, you know, politically expedient ones? Um, Like I said, these commissions are already operating in other states, um, and they've been shown to be more fair. That means, you know, one party doesn't get an advantage just because they got to draw the maps. Um, the number of seats that a party gets uh, more accurately uh, kind of uh, jives with the number of votes they got, right? It's, 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 um, it, it just makes common sense. Um, uh, the, just the races are more competitive. So there are actually, you know, new candidates that get into the, into the races. Um, there are fewer uncontested races, um, and uh, they're more responsive. So seats actually do change hands uh, with a change in 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 the vote uh, in voter sentiment, and that's exactly what we um, are seeking to um, have again here in Michigan. Um, and um, so. I, I want to take, I have like one minute, unfortunately, but I wanted to kind of um, maybe address some of the more common uh, uh, arguments that we hear against the proposal. Uh, number one, that it's a bunch of amateurs, you know, and this is like a really uh, technical process. Uh, in fact, uh, the legislators right now, like I said, you know, the evidence just shows that they outsource and they, and there's a one quote in, the, in a bridge article that says, well, we outsource everything and they, and they outsource redistricting as well to, um, Experts and consultants, and and that would that would be the same process that this commission would have available to it. So we guaranteed them a budget, um, and they could hire their experts um, to advise them. And the big difference, of course, like I said before, is that it would all be transparent. You would know who they hired, and what maps they were considering, and why they rejected ones and then adopted other ones. Thank you. I could talk all day, and I'm happy to, <laughs> but unfortunately, we have time limits. Thank you, Nancy. We now turn to Sharon Delente, who will uh, talk about Proposal 3. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for welcoming me back to the Ford School. Yes, I am the alumni on the panel here. Um, when I went here, we did not have this beautiful room or this beautiful building, so I appreciate very much being welcomed back to enjoy the fruits of what has come after I graduated. Um, and I also just want to, um, before I start, I think as an alumni and also for the students in the room, I, I see lots of students. Um, you know, I, I just want to give you a second for how did I get here, right? Like, why I'm the voting rights strategist at the ACLU of Michigan, and I just, you know, want to share for a minute, like, how, how does that come to be? Um, and, and the answer is I spent a lot of time protecting voters on election day. I, I spent a lot of time volunteering in different programs that seek to address challenges that voters have on election day. I did did that going back to the time that I graduated actually from here and was waiting for my bar results. And I've done it in every election, primary, presidential, midterm elections. And so what that means is I hear a lot of noise and chaos of what happens on election day, right? I hear all the challenges, well, as many as I can possibly answer the phone, of the challenges that voters are facing um, when they go to cast their ballot here in Michigan. And so that really became a, the passion that led to me just really spending all of my time now at the ACLU working on voting rights. So I'm here to talk about Proposal 3, otherwise known as Promote the Vote. We need to have catchy names because, you know, Proposal 3, Proposal 2, <laughs> it's just not quite as exciting as these awesome names we've come up with. Um, so, so, so. In my lifetime, which is not necessarily, we have plenty of folks on the panel who can talk outside of the scope of my lifetime, voting rights and access to the ballot was a fundamental right that there, you know, while people could disagree perhaps to some degree about the mechanics, there was this general consensus that people should be able to access the ballot. That, that we, you know, once we, we passed the Voting Rights Act and we moved out of the civil rights era, there was, a, there was more of a frame, at least in my lifetime, that people should be able to vote. Barriers to voting were un-American, right? You shouldn't be erecting barriers to people being able to make their voices heard, that the core of our democracy is citizens being able to make their voices heard on election day. Um, and so we had, you know, a series of, of laws that were adopted nationally by Republicans and Democrats, signed by, you know, uh, Republican presidents, signed by Democratic presidents. And in, in, in these instances, they expanded access to the ballot. <clears throat> so the things that I'm thinking of are the National Voting and Voter Registration Act in 1993, um, significantly increases access to voter registration. Um, in 2002, we have the Help America Vote Act adopted nationally, again, significantly addressing access issues, ensuring that individuals are never turned away at the, at the ballot box. That, that is the direct quote of the Sixth Circuit, um, interpreting a law under the Help America Vote Act. No citizen should be turned away. Will you remember my story about how, what I, how I got here and how I've been listening to the stories of voters? Voters are turned away in every single election. Voters are turned away right here in Ann Arbor. Voters are turned away in the primary. Every election, I talk to voters who were turned away at the ballot box. Sometimes I'm able to give them advice and send them back because it's before 8 o'clock and, and they're able to resolve that situation. But not always. Just in the primary, I have individuals who were disenfranchised in violation of state and federal law. So that concerns me. Every single, if there's even one voter, that concerns me. That's how passionate I am about it. So, 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 so we have this nonpartisan history of embracing access. And then one of the things that you may not know is that Michigan, in part due to this gentleman sitting next to me, but others that I'll talk about, was a pivotal state in expanding access. So I spoke about the National Voter Registration Act. The National Voter Registration Act um, is, the, is the law that nationally adopted the motor voter program. That's the thing that everybody who's my age or younger is familiar with. When you go to get your driver's license, you're able to get registered. Well, as others on the panel can definitely tell you, it didn't used to be so easy. You had to take the onus on yourself to show up at a, at a different elected official's or uh, appointed official's office and fill out a form. It used to be much harder. Well, guess where that amazing innovation 
that registered millions and millions and millions. I see heads shaking. No question the extraordinary impact of that innovation. It started right here in Michigan. So under um, the then Secretary of State, Richard Austin, and the gentleman to my left who will have an opportunity to talk more about this, um, Michigan was the first state to adopt this innovation. And it wasn't the only innovation that Michigan led on. The second um, law that I mentioned was the Help America Vote Act. It has a very critical provision where it required states to have a statewide voter registration database. So when you move around a state, you can easily move your registration with you. Again, an access, a way to increase access, a way to make sure that individuals are staying registered so they're never silenced at the ballot box. That also was a national innovation that was adopted that began here in Michigan. So Michigan has this extraordinary history as an innovator in so many areas, technology, the automobile industry, but also in voting. But unfortunately, at some point, that history came to a grinding halt. And so sadly today, Michigan and Mississippi are the only states that have failed to adopt any recent reforms that increase access to the ballot. I just want you to, I want to say that one more time. Michigan and Mississippi are the only states in the country that have failed to adopt recent reforms to increase access to the ballot. What do I mean by that? Name your favorite reform. Early voting, no reason absentee voting, pre-registration, election day registration, same day registration, online voter registration, take your pick. We're the only, it's us and Mississippi. And so what does that tell me? That tells me actually that voting rights is still a very nonpartisan issue. Why? Because all the states in the country are finding ways to increase access. And I've been saying that from day one on Proposal 3. Why is that? Because the citizens of this state and the rest of the country believe that voting access is a nonpartisan issue. That access is, is without question something that citizens who are eligible and meet the requirements of eligibility in our state and every other state should be able to cast their ballot. Elected officials may wrangle about it, they may argue about it, but that's not how the citizens feel. And, and so Proposal 3 comes out of that very shocking statistic. It comes out of that very shocking reality that Michigan has fallen behind. I'm often asked why I'm not an elected official in the state legislature or the state senate. I'm not the governor. I can't answer that question. I think my time is better served trying to solve the problem. So proposal three, uh, I have uh, a half sheet if you want it here. You can get a full summary of it. Um, but proposal three would, would, would adopt um, a number of amendments to our Constitution, they're all in one section, but a number of policies would be enshrined in the Constitution that would increase access and also increase security. Because citizens, again, across the political spectrum in a nonpartisan way are also concerned about security. And there are things that Michigan can and should be doing. So the first thing that Promote the Vote does, Proposal 3 does, is protect the right to a secret ballot. There is language in the Constitution right now regarding a secret ballot, but it entrusts the legislature with the authority to protect that. I don't know about you all, but I would rather have my own right to a secret ballot and not leave that to the legislature. So Proposal 3 would address that. The second thing is Proposal 3 would enshrine in the Constitution the requirement that military and overseas voters be sent a ballot 45 days before. This is mirroring um, obligations that are in state or federal law, but it's enshrining them in our Constitution, um, and, it, and therefore it could not be eliminated by future acts of the legislature. The next thing is automatic voter registration, allowing citizens to be automatically registered unless they refuse. This is still America. You can still choose to say no. But if you don't say no you're automatic, and you're eligible, you're automatically registered to vote at the Secretary of State's office. Um, this is something that is the newest reform um, of, the, of the access to the ballot uh, reforms that have come online. But already in just a few short years, 14 states have adopted automatic voter registration. And they're seeing really significant impacts. They're seeing significant impacts because individuals who are registered and are on the rolls are are then communicated with by partisan campaigns or nonpartisan campaigns. And so they start to be a part of the democratic little d civic infrastructure and they are and then they they are not voting necessarily at the same rate that 
all citizens are voting, but they are voting in significant numbers. And so those individuals would not have gotten registered um, if there hadn't been automatic voter registration. So I'll quickly move through the other components. It would, uh, Michigan is one of only a, uh, about a dozen states that has a voter registration deadline tomorrow. Everybody, anybody unregistered in the room, come see me, we can handle that. <laughs> Ask everybody you know between here and bedtime tonight and all day tomorrow, make sure they're all registered. Um, we have a 30-day voter registration deadline. It's the longest allowed by federal law. Most states don't have a, a deadline that long anymore. And a number of states have gone to the point of allowing citizens to register up to and including election day. And proposal three would allow that. But in a secure way, you'd have to provide proof of residency and you'd have to appear in person before an election official. This is not new people. The three states that first created uh, adapted election day voter registration have had it for 40 years. I think we can do it. <laughs> I think we can. Um, just a few more. No reason absentee voting, which um, thank you to the gentleman next to me. Uh, Michigan has been trying to get that since 1990. Here we are, 28 years later. Thank God Proposal 3 will finally deliver it to you. Um, it's it's a, a very nonpartisan reform. Uh, 37 or 38 states have either no reason absentee voting or early voting, so you as a citizen can choose to vote prior to Election Day if that's what's most convenient for you. Imagine that. <laughs> make it convenient for you to vote, and therefore you'll make your voice heard. The last two components are straight ticket voting. So the citizens of Michigan have had it for 125 years, 127 I think. Um, very sadly, it will not be on the available this year. The citizens have twice had it taken away by the legislature and they've twice put it back in. Here's the dirty little secret. Straight party voting is not a partisan thing. Individuals in Detroit use it and primarily vote Democratic, but so do significant numbers of individuals in Ottawa County, and they significantly vote Republican. It's an efficiency that makes it easier for citizens to cast their ballot in an efficient manner. And the last one, and perhaps one of the most important ones, I think, is an audit. Um, Michigan has had something that is called an audit, but it's not actually checking that how we're how we're tabulating the ballots is also how they were meant to be tabulated, meaning when you put, when you put your ballots into the machine, that what's coming out as the counts of the votes is actually being checked and audited. And so proposal three would implement that as well. And so again, it's this perfect marriage that is being supported by over 70% of voters in recent polls of increasing access and having a more secure election system because we can have both and we deserve to have both. Thank you, Sharon. Now, having heard uh, the arguments in favor of the two ballot proposals, we turn to Richard McClellan, who will offer some views on the other side of the picture. Uh, I've been asked to uh, talk about why the VNP would not be a good state policy. So I'm going to follow strictly that instruction as a complicated proposal. And then I was asked to add a couple of minutes on the promote the vote proposal we just heard about. Uh, let me just, a bigger picture that is not part of this, but I, something I've been thinking about, because I've been active in this area for 50 years. There seems to be a trend to abandon kind of the old traditional uh, forms of democracy. Representative government, you get your representatives, they manage the government for you, you decide a couple years later uh, whether you want them in there. We, we had, on the, we've always had in Michigan, it's a good reason, uh, the, this uh, initiative and referendum. The people have always referred to themselves the ability to do this, but it was a very rare occurrence. But as we have gotten fed up with our legislature, uh, and possibly because of gerrymandering, we more and more are moving toward these other non-traditional methods of running the government giving people a 
package deal and a vote up or vote down, and you don't have uh, an opportunity uh, to have the process that I went through for 30 years in the legislature until term limits came along. They used to spend months on legislation, the election code, and the election committee was bipartisan. They'd fight over things, but they really got into it. You don't see that anymore. Legislature gets a bill in front of them, they got the votes, they move it out. So the system has changed and the voters' response to it has changed. This uh, voters, not uh, politicians, is, a, is an example of that. If voters, not po is a grab bag of good and bad provisions. I don't want anybody to suggest that it's, it's all bad. In fact, several of them are either an existing law or would be in anybody's fair system, respecting existing boundaries. Although there are some people that believe those are racist and we should not be ex uh, rec recognizing existing county boundaries that were set up 100 years ago. But in general, that's accepted. Minimizing the variance between populations, something that the Supreme Court decided 30, 40 years ago, the one person, one vote. Now they're fighting over whether one person, one vote, who the persons are. Are they only eligible voters in a district or are all the persons in the district? I think it's all the persons. The uh, uh, census counts everybody, prisoners, uh, illegal aliens, uh, children. So uh, that's what I think it should be, but it, it does get fought over. It's not in this proposal. Uh, it accepts certain things. Contiguous districts, uh, gerrymandering is an art. Uh, and uh, you're, if, if we didn't have continuous dig districts, we'd have a piece of Democrats in the UP attached to a piece in Bay City to create a district, I should, or the other way around. So those are, they're, um, they are decent, establishing a timeline and a procedure is good government. But here's what I oppose about this. It is this, what I call, a, I was worried about saying it, a Rube Goldberg structure. Very complicated. <coughs> um, and uh, and, and, it, and it, it, they keep talking about nonpartisan, nonpartisan, no politicians. Well, uh, the commission is selected by a partisan elected Secretary of State. Uh, she is to generate a list of 10,000 voters randomly invited by her or him. I guess there's only two, there are two women running uh, to apply. Um, and then the, SO, the State, Secretary of State randomly ex selects from these pools Democrats, Republicans, and self-identifying as being unaffiliated doesn't mean they're not partisan. It means they're not affiliated. It doesn't mean they're independent. They can be very strong partisans and probably will be just as long as they can technically show they are unaffiliated. So I guarantee you there will be an effort over the years to make sure each party has its own list of unaffiliated people that will be in the pools. Um, the biggest proposal that I op oppose in this is this term, communities of interest, to be protected. I, I gather it's used in other states, but I'm kind of the old school. Political uh, districts represent people in a particular geographic district. Now, we, we shifted away from that a few decades ago because of the racial issue. And we now, that is a community of interest that is, is particularly well protected. And if you watch the process, it's been used by both parties. It's used because of the, the way people live. 
there are more minority voters in urban areas, you can, as they say, pack them and stack them. You can squeeze more minority districts into some of these bigger urban areas and disadvantage um, maybe a Democrats that aren't the right color from this. And it goes the other way. They go back and forth. Who they cut deals with has been amazing if you read the history of it. So once we get communities of interest, and to me, um, this is largely a result of the trend over the last couple, you know, recent, not, not right away, but a few times, that the Democratic Party no longer represents issues. It represents communities of interest. If you talk to people that go to their convention, it's all about which caucus you go to. Are you in the urban caucus? Are you in the gay caucus? Are you in the women? It's, it's much more where, how the parties see themselves. And they see themselves as a cluster of these groups that all have to be accommodated. And uh, I would say there's a community of interest in most of the issues, uh, but, but I don't think that's a good idea. And, um, and so the, the, the commission has to defend these districts <coughs> through maps and statistics and so on in the proposal. But how are they going to disclose who the communities of interest are that it has favored in this plan? And who are the other communities of districts that are going to be disfavored? They never answer that, and I'm Nancy's taking notes, maybe she'll answer it. <laughs> but I don't, to me, as a lawyer and somebody who gets into this stuff, I guarantee you there's going to be some huge battles over within the various communities of interest that are excluded uh, compared to the ones that are included. Um, one of the things that I just didn't like in here, it bans, it bans commissioners from talking to ordinary people. You can't talk to anybody. Uh, you can only talk to your staff, attorneys, experts, and consultants. Uh, I'm sorry, these are a group of random, randomly selected people. <clears throat> I want them walking around talking to people, saying, hey, I'm on this commission. I just, my name got drawn. I'm going to do my job. What do you think? Can't do that. You can only talk to your staff, your attorneys, your experts and your consultants. I don't think that's good public policy. That gives a lie to this idea that this is for people, not politicians. I think that it, it just is it's wrong. And in final conclusion, um, I think this is a, it tends to do too much and end up, ends up with a complex structure that will end in endless disputes. Now, I'm 76. I'm not practicing law anymore. But many of my younger colleagues are going to have a lot of fun with this. And it's going to, anybody thinks that this is the perfect structure that will last forever in Michigan because it's the fairest and the people will love it and the politicians will accept it. I don't think so. We fight over politics because politics Politics is a tool by which we allocate wealth in our state. We decide who gets money. So it's all about the money, and it will continue to be, and there will continue to be fights over it. I'm going to stop on that one. I'm going to give you two minutes on <coughs> promote the vote. Um, I think the promote the vote uh, is largely just a grab bag of Good government ideas have been kicking around. The Republicans have basically stopped them, is correct. Uh, they have operated on, an, on another model uh, that is the integrity of the process requires procedural steps and filing deadlines and all this kind of stuff. That was the view of both parties and our political system for 100 years or so. Uh, we, we really have been moving along toward a much more open process. Um, 
Uh, for example, straight party line voting, Republicans block that because they think it favors Democrats. No reason absentee. They block that because they think it serves people that aren't serious about voting and don't have reason and they shouldn't do it. I don't see anything wrong with those proposals. Uh, uh, they are, I wouldn't put them in the Constitution, but they're fine. But I think there's some other things uh, that may or may, may not create problems. There is this idea of automatic registration as a result of doing business with the Secretary of State. All you have to do is be do business with her or him. That's not the worst thing in the world if it's, if it's regulated. Now, the Secretary of State doesn't necessarily determine whether you're a citizen or whether you're eligible to vote or you're a former felon when you're doing business with the Secretary of State. That's not their business. And then if all of a sudden it, it's been happening where people who are not citizens go in on this motor voter, get their driver's license, and they, the clerk will say, oh, do you want to be a, do you want to vote? Boom, yes. And they're not eligible. Um, the registration by mail uh, is new. It's something that I wouldn't vote for. Uh, but I think the way they've written it, where you have to show up, a real person has to show up the first time you vote with a real ID, makes it worth. Same with same-day registration. I have been involved in a lot of elections um, for many, many years. I sort of ran the what the Republicans called the voter integrity unit to see what was going on. It was bad. The Democrats called us the voter suppression unit. Uh, they're winning that argument, unfortunately. But what I found was almost everything we got on Election Day with people all over the state was no corruption, just people made mistakes. It's getting harder and harder to have skilled election day workers, um, and, and therefore it's getting raggedy around the edges sometimes. But there's very little corruption in my mind, uh, organized corruption. It doesn't mean some voters are not treated badly. I, I argue that it's mostly the people that are, are not. The worst part of this provision that I uh, don't, that I feel, is if you end up per permanently locking these things into the Constitution, you eliminate the normal legislative process. Now, I'm sure all these fine left-wing groups that are listed as the draft sponsors of it uh, think they have created the perfect model for elections, and they're going to lock it in the Constitution. The truth is, in about 10 years, they will want something different, too. And they'll have to go back to the people instead of going back to the legislature. So the, overall, Proposal 3 is not the worst, but it has some bad things in it that will at least get me to vote no. Uh, proposal 2 is awful. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you've heard <coughs> the other side of that. And with that, I'll stop and listen to our expert down the table. <laughs> and now we turn to the professional election administrator on our panel, uh, Chris Thomas, who has served governors and secretaries of state with both parties. And uh, it turned his hair gray, maybe, but. Yeah. He was there for three and a half decades, and uh, we'll get his views on these two proposals. Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Ford School for holding this. They, it's a marvelous uh, opportunity for everyone to get a good view of what's going on with these proposals. And it's good to be with my friend Richard on a panel. You always know where Richard is. You <laughs> never have any doubt. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, the ACL used, used to sue me all the time. And in retirement, they've become my best friends. So <laughs> it's been just great. Uh, so I did work in this business for a long time. 
Uh, I was uh, the director of elections for uh, 36 years. I was with the department for 40. And I worked for the Federal Election Commission for a few years before that. So uh, it's been a long haul in election administration. And as an administrator, I was a civil servant. So I didn't go out and support ballot proposals. This is the first time I've had this opportunity. So I'm trying to catch <coughs> up a bit. So just for, um, I guess, notice here, I've not endorsed Proposal 2, but I have endorsed Proposal 3. Um, and I'm not opposed to Proposal 2, but I just haven't done a public endorsement. So I'll make a few comments about Proposal 2 and then move on to Proposal 3, which gets my blood running a little, little thicker. So um, it's, it is complicated. I mean, Richard's got it down exactly right. This is a complicated process. It always has been. There's a lot of moving parts. And the lawyers will do well. Uh, journalism will have a good time following them. Uh, but I think it's time to try something new. So we've had the Republicans have had their good fortune to control the entire process in, in uh, 2001 when the districts were drawn, and again in 2011. So they've had basically a 20-year period where they've had all the marbles. And by the time they got to 2011, uh, they might have gotten what some would call a little greedy, which is why we're here today on this issue, because people, uh, I think, believe it's gone a little too far. I mean, you look at our state Senate. There's 27 Republicans and 11 Democrats. Now, it's just hard to imagine in this state how that could be. Well, it's the art of drawing the line. So um, I would make a couple other comments here. So one of the deals is, you know, the four Republicans, four Democrats, and five unaffiliated. And Richard's right. I mean, it's going to, how they end up defining that term is going to be critical. But there's one thing in Lansing thought, which I think, doesn't really mirror the rest of, of uh, the electorate, is that people's partisan affiliations, whether they're hard or loose, somehow or another define their character. And in Lansing, that's pretty much the case. I mean, you're either this or you're that, and they believe that there is no middle ground. Um, I think most people have a, a leaning one way or another, but it's not the most central thing in their life to be a the lean Republican or a lean Democratic. They have many other issues that motivate them. And they may be ideology, uh, and they may be just issues. And of course, we're all starting to move, was what they tell us nationally. To get, you know, ideologically, we're finding our, our uh, islands. And I'm in the territory of Ann Arbor today. Um, so when they talk about drawing lines that don't disproportionately advantage or disadvantage one of the political parties, well, the Republicans aren't going to do so well here. And they won't do so well in Detroit, but they'll do very well in many other areas of the state. So it's going to, there will be more competitive districts, but not every district's going to be competitive. So you just need to keep that in mind because of the nature of the populations uh, that they uh, represent. And Richard is right, this concept of community of interest, uh, though that is going to be uh, a real linchpin in this in terms of them figuring out how this is going to work. Um, and also this concept of the acceptable measures of partisan fairness. This is the heart of the litigation that's been going on, is how do you determine fairness? And are these efforts from Wisconsin and elsewhere to try to get the Supreme Court to recognize that and make that a, a factor? I mean, right now, one of the apportionment factors that's been approved by the U.S. Supreme Court is that you don't throw the incumbent out of its district. Now, that's, to most people, kind of a ridiculous deal. So in California, which is very, I think that's the one that's most similar to Michigan, um, the, the way it worked. And it was kind of interesting because they used it in 2011. So 45% of um, the, the incumbents had territory that wasn't part of their district before. And 41% of them had more newer voters that they never represented. So it did mix things up a bit. 
and they didn't consider where incumbents were. So they threw a lot of incumbents together. And sometimes they ran against each other, sometimes they just retired. So I think that um, this is a proposal that's got some merit because of where we find themselves. Now, if the Democrats get all those marbles, they're such nice people. They would never do the same thing, would they? <laughs> Yes, they would. <laughs> and yes, they would, because that's the game. That's exactly the way the game works. There's nothing evil lurking in this. It's just the game of, it, this is a zero-sum game, folks. We do not have proportionate representation. You either win the district or you lose it. And that, that's what that's all about. So I'm going to shift gears here. So I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Proposal 3, Promote the Vote. This is a critical opportunity for Michigan to catch up. Michigan has lagged behind the rest of the states in terms of, of access to the ballot. And the way it's been done in this state before the last decade and a half was that access would be increased and there'd be a measurable deterrent to balance it. So in other words, you don't just slam the door and say fraud, fraud, fraud. We hear the fraudsters all the time, and that is the biggest untruth uh, out there. And I, Richard hit it right. There is not massive fraud. But that is the, the reason that's given in many cases of why we're not moving forward. Um, term limits may well play a role in that. Uh, that is probably one of the most unhealthy things that Michigan has ever done. So when you look at no reason absentee balloting, the Presidential Commission on Election Administration highly recommended that every state should give the voters that opportunity to vote. Michigan's one of 13 states that, that does not do that. Now, it's funny. We give everyone 60 and older the opportunity to vote no reason. Age is not a reason, folks. That's just a grant of no reason absentee voting to one segment of the population. And they've handled it so well that I'm sure that uh, the rest of the population can get on board and have learned from senior citizens like myself that uh, this works just fine. Automatic registration, I mean, look, the beginning and the end of automatic registration is the question. Nobody's being automatically registered without them standing there and answering a question. Right now, the Secretary of State said, do you want to register to vote? Yes or no? This will say you'll be registered to vote unless you decline to be registered. That's the only difference. All the citizenship safeguards done at Secretary of State's office remain in full effect. So non-citizens are not sneaking through because of this proposal. So I think that's something that everyone needs to bear in mind. And it actually follows the National Voter Registration Act, which says a, voter, a, a driver's license application shall be a voter registration application unless the voter declines in writing. We don't do it that way. We should be doing it that way. That's the federal law. So the safeguards are there. Um, this, this is just a, a, a good way to go about it. In straight party voting, now, we've had consolidation of elections in this state for the last decade and a half, which is a good thing. We've eliminated all these special elections all over the place and gone to four election dates, and now three. But when we did that, straight party voting was a predicate. And so what did the legislature do? Knowing that straight party voting was there, they loaded up the general election ballot. First, they put all the villages on the general election ballot. Then they put all the school districts on the election, the general election day ballot. And now they've permitted cities to go on to the election day ballot in November of the even year. So we're making this a longer and longer process for voters. And without straight party voting, it's just going to make it worse for everybody. Um, and obviously they put an appropriation in to take care of the um, uh, the, the to kill the ability to have a referendum, because you can't referendum appropriation bill. It's a very sneaky tactic that's being used now in Lansing. 
when they did it before in 64 and 2002, bam, as a referendum, overwhelmingly react, reenacted by the voters. So I would note that the other things that deal with uh, re registration in terms of moving to 30 day, that's fine. It's not going to cause any problems. We have a lot of electronic registrations now that are coming in, so there's no real clerk issue there. The 14 days before the election, it got to show up in person. You've got to have proof, a document, proving where you register or where you're, where you're a resident. And this is going to be a very low volume. It's an extra trip, folks, that people have to make to the clerk's office. Election day registration is really a safety net. It'll really kind of remove what we have now with the affidavit ballots. And one thing I want to make absolutely clear, this is not done in the polling place on election day. This will only be done in a clerk's office. So it's not like people are going to inundate polling places and try to force themselves onto the file. They're going to have to go to the actual city clerk and go through this process to get on the ballot. And the post-election audits, this fits right in with the national security issues on our election system. And Michigan is stepping up to this, and it's time for them uh, to, to really take this on. Uh, the Bureau's done a great job uh, in Lansing, and we're ready for that next step. They have come up with risk-limiting audits that can use statistical sampling that actually can tell you something about the results rather than just taking 5% and trying to make some sense out of it. So these are rights. These are rights for voters. And these are things that are being done. They're common sense programs that are being done in many other states uh, without any big fraud issues or anything else. So it's really time for Michigan to step up and open up access and maintain security. Thank you. Well, thank you to our four panelists. And now we'll turn to some questions from the audience. Four Ford School students will be responsible for sorting the questions and choosing them. Um, they represent two of the sponsors of our panel, the student groups We Listen and Domestic Policy Corps. Two of them have a microphone, and they will introduce themselves. The other two lack a microphone, so let me introduce them. <laughs> uh, the folks who are sorting the, the questions down here are Chris Garzon Rivera from the Domestic Policy Corps, and Nick Tomeno from We Listen, and Tom Vivaco, the Associate Director of Close Up, is giving him a hand here on the end. So, let me turn first to the, um, oh, before we turn to the questions, let's, that uh, our timekeeper who has kept us right on schedule here is uh, Heather Kinningham, and we thank her. So let me turn now to the students who will be reading the questions, let them introduce themselves, and ask the first question. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm a first year MPP student here, um, and I am also part of the Domestic Policy Corps, and also as a lifelong Michigander and someone very interested in democratic engagement, as clearly so many other people are. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, we have a lot of really great questions, so we'll try to get through as many as we can, but maybe just keep that in mind while we're going through that we'll try to get to as many as possible. Our first one is in regards to Proposition 3. Has research been done to estimate how much this proposal may increase voter participation rates? So, I, oh, yes. Um, the Center for American uh, Progress did a report earlier this year. They actually did, they've done a number of reports that have been really helpful for me. One was on election security, but then they did a report where they estimated the um, the impact of all the sort of common sense reforms that different states are doing. And so what we're saying now is that it would increase turnout by several hundred thousand voters in 2020. Um, according to the Center for American po uh, Progress, they would estimate about 400,000 voters. But I'm guessing this gentleman might have a... No. Okay. All right. So that's, um, you know, it's a little bit hard to predict um, because any, any forms of those research are always done in another state, right? And so all the different in intricacies of an election system can have an impact. But um, that's the estimate um, that, that we've been going with because they did the report to help us out with it. 
Wonderful. So my name is Allie Berry. I am a senior in the undergraduate BA program here, and I'm involved with We Listen. Um, our question is for Nancy about um, Prop 2. How, how would it be possible to stop lobbyists and their dollars from influencing the members of the commission of this redistricting committee? Right. So um, again, I would go to uh, transparency. So um, uh, Mr. McClellan said earlier that the commissioners would not be able to be talking to the public. Um, that's, that's not true. Uh, it's that they would have to, the commissioners would have to be talking to the public um, at open meetings only. There's, there'd be no more of this backroom kind of secretive um, uh, redistricting that's going on right now. So we know what we have right now, which is that lobbyists go and, and they're, they're able to have influence on the maps. Um, again, this bridge article uncovered, you know, I mean, they were going through the emails that were uncovered during this litigation. And the people, the consultants that were um, drawing these maps um, shared them with, you know, the DeVos family and other um, big Republican donors uh, for their input. So that is happening right now. It's just that we don't actually know, um, you know, who's involved and um, what influence they have unless, you know, it comes to light through litigation. Um, under our proposal, uh, the commissioners, again, it would be written into the Constitution that they would have to conduct all of their business in the light of day. So that's how you would know. This is perhaps a little bit towards Proposition 3. Um, what is any of your opinion on laws such as what the Australians have that mandate that each voter must vote? This question writer notes that perhaps it's a little invasive on people's rights, but it's an interesting idea. Do you have thoughts? Do you have an opinion? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that would be interesting to try to do in this country. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think every voter should vote. Um, what I believe they do is levy a little uh, fine or tax on them if they don't vote. Um, it might stimulate a few to do that, but um, one thing we have in this country right now is a right not to vote. Anybody else want to comment on that one? Okay. So this one is for Mr. McClellan. Um, the question is, you touched on a little bit how you Could you, you speak up a little bit? I'm deaf in this ear and I haven't heard you. That's okay. Um, you mentioned briefly that you thought that Prop 3 wasn't necessarily the worst. And so the question is, what election reforms would you support, if any at all? Perhaps the elect elimination of the Electoral College or a ranked <laughs> voting system to help move politicians to the middle? Okay, you got to slow down and speak up. Okay. Okay. Regarding Prop 3, which you mentioned yeah. wasn't necessarily the worst, the question is, what election reforms would you support? What election re reforms would I support? Right. And then um, they give two examples, one yeah. being the elimination of the Electoral College and the other being a ranked voting system. Well, I'm conservative and I tend not to change something we've had for a couple hundred years. But I do believe that the rules from time to time an election should be changed. I'm not opposed at all. In fact, I've been involved in them for 40 years. Uh, legislative changes to modernize and make our rules of the elections more uh, consistent with the Constitution that says preserve the purity of elections. So as new technology comes in, things like same-day registration, a number of those things might, be, might work fine. I'm not at all opposed to them. Uh, but things like the Electoral College, that is such a huge change. It's like the um, national one person, one vote that would shift all the power to California and New York and Texas. I'm against that. And uh, the guy in charge running that is a Republican. I, I believe he's delusional. Uh, the, it's, it's kind of an ugly situation, the Electoral College, but it certainly reflects the fact that the US, United States is a group of sovereign states. We aren't one country that has one population. So I'm, I'm against that sort of thing and a number of other 
give me almost any issue and I'll give you an opinion one way or the other. Because <laughs> I've spent a lot of time on a lot of these. I'll just say one more thing that I, I was going to bring up. Voter, voter who let everybody vote in some communities means illegal aliens, uh, people just come over. They, th that I don't believe in. I believe the vote is a right of a citizen. And if you've ever been to a citizenship swearing in ceremony and you see new Americans and what they think about their adopted country and the rights that they have, they do not want people who haven't gone through the work because it's hard work to be a citizen. So I'm in favor of voting for citizens, all citizens, unless you're excluded. And I'm not, if you're in prison, no. But if you get out of prison, yes. So these are complicated issues and you're not going to be able to solve them by one shot ballot proposal put together by some group in a dark room. Now, I was not invited to their drafting sessions. I guarantee you, voters not populations were put together by a very secretive group. Well, that leads right into our next question, which is coming to us from Twitter. What is the logic of denying the right to vote to convicted felons, not only the ones paroled, but also ones currently incarcerated? And this can be for Richard or Mr. McClellan, but also for any of the panelists. I think the only theory is that they have forfeited their right to be treated as a regular citizen. And um, I used to be chairman of the uh, Michigan Corrections Commission. And, um, and I'd go down to the prisons a couple times. And I, it, it's one of those things that I think may just be uh, outdated. I, I, I firmly believe that if you've done your time and you're back in society, you should not be disqualified from getting licenses for professions. They rejected two former women that were inmates and had learned to be massage therapists in prison so they could get a job. So they went to get a job and the licensing board of the same state government said, no, you can't do it. Uh, I just don't believe in that if you're a, if you're a former convicted felon, you should be treated to all the rights of a citizen restored to his or her thing. When they go to prison or certain things, that is a policy decision. I don't know that I would make, but it was made, and it's not unreasonable to say you have forfeited certain rights while well, you forfeited your personal freedom, for one thing. <coughs> so that's my view on that one. I would just make a quick comment. So in Michigan, as Richard's describing, when you're released, you've served your time, you have your rights back, and there's no process you need to go through. And this is on the Florida um, mm -hmm. ballot this year, where in Florida, you don't get your rights back, and you have to go to a board that I believe the governor participates in, a very lengthy process, in order to get those back. So there are big differences across the country on how states handle this. Okay, great. This is another question for Mr. Thomas. You mentioned term limits as bad. Can you elaborate on that? And do others have thoughts, especially their impact on gerrymandering? Yeah, I think they stink. Um, <laughs> and I think, as Richard's indicated, it has had uh, a very bad effect on the continuity of government. Um, the idea, I mean, everybody's term limit. You can vote them out. I mean, the people stay because people continue to vote them in. And so what happened, in my opinion, is that the power shifted from these legislative committees, like Richard mentioned, back in those days, the election committee, it was very robust. And these folks were on that for a number of years. They understood a good part of the process. <clears throat> the folks that come now, they're, they're six years in the House. They're eight years in the Senate. They don't stay on the same committees. They move around. They don't understand this stuff. The best thing about elections to them is 
they got elected under the rules, <laughs> and it was good for them. But they don't really understand the intricacies. So where's that power gone? It's gone to lobbyists and a little bit to the bureaucracy um, because these folks don't know. And then when the committee staff, when they started retiring, they lost everything. So uh, it's, it's been a bad deal, uh, and I, I don't think the state's been served well. This is a concern that Mr. McClellan brought, brought up. Perhaps this would be for Ms. Wang to respond to, but proposal two proposes a 13-member board composed of four Democrats, four Republicans, and five independents or non-affiliated. What is or how would independents be selected? Will it be verified that they are independent or non-affiliated? Right, so um, if I may just uh, start with a clarification. So uh, Mr. McClellan said that the Secretary of State would be selecting these commissioners. Um, that's not true. So people would have the ability to apply. Uh, and then the selection is only just her uh, or him um, randomly choosing um, you know, uh, applications from the pool of people that applied. Um, in terms of uh, party affiliation, so here in Michigan, as um, many of you know, we don't have party registration, and so um, th on the application form, you'd have to self-identify as a Republican or a Democrat or uh, non-affiliated under oath. The term unaffiliated or affiliated is ripe for a lot of litigation. <laughs> Are we going to force party registration, so you're not registered. What, what do we mean by not affiliated? Again, it doesn't mean you don't have partisan views. It means you're not affiliated at that time with a particular party. I'm just a lawyer. I, I look for all the monkey wrenches that we could possibly throw at this if it's, if it's adopted. I won't be doing it, but I know other lawyers will. <laughs> This is a question for Ms. Delente. Um, you referred to voting access reform as bipartisan, but historically Republicans have not supported greater access to polls. How much reform across the nation has been accomplished by citizen-led ballot initiatives versus legislative reform? Well, that's tough. Um, okay, so, so I sometimes people push back on me and they ask this question. They want me to say that it is a partisan issue, um, and if and if you if you notice, I said citizens, um, the citizens and the public think of this as a nonpartisan issue. I can't necessarily speak to every individual state legislature or even our own state legislature over the last few years. I obviously know, and and I and I wouldn't um, suggest otherwise that since twenty since the, the election of Barack Obama, there has been a wave of anti-voter laws around the country, most significantly voter ID laws, um, and I'm aware of that. But I don't think that negates the fact that you've also seen a variety of states with Republican governors and Republican legislators adopting reforms. And so I think one thing that Mr. Thomas has been working on is online voter registration. 38 states have online voter registration now. That, by definition, must include red states, right? Um, another example just off the top of my head would be automatic voter registration. Automatic voter registration is the newest. Some states that come to mind that have it are Alaska. Not a particularly blue state, in case you didn't know. Um, and Alaska actually adopted it through um, a, a ballot initiative. So um, in Alaska's case, automatic you are automatically registered to vote when you get, I don't remember the term, but in Alaska when you get benefits under their... Um, oil and gas program. So when you become a part of that program, you also get automatically registered. And that was through ballot initiative. Um, I'm not sure that, um, I can't give you exact numbers on how many states have adopted reform through ballot initiatives. The other one that comes to mind is Maryland, I think, adopted um, uh, <coughs> some reforms through ballot initiative. I think if you have a legislature that's willing to provide the reform through the legislative process, you don't take the extraordinary expense 
and hundreds of thousands of signatures to try and do it through a ballot initiative. But after 28 years of waiting for just no reason absentee voting, it didn't seem like there were any other options. This will be the final question we have time for. This can be for any of our panelists, for either of the, the propositions. What impact do these proposals have on marginalized um, or economically disadvantaged urban communities um, was proposed in the question. Marginalized what kind of? Marginalized groups or um, economically disadvantaged communities. I'll just go first because I just talked. So I mean, one of the things, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm just, and then I can be done. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, individuals who struggle to vote and register are often individuals who move a lot right, um, who, who have low levels of education or low income. Why? Because all those things kind of fit together, right? If you have a low income, you are more likely to be moving. Your, your, home, your home situation and your housing is likely to be less stable. And so the more often you're moving, the more often you have to be updating your voter registration and the more likely your registration is not going to be valid. For me, at this point in my life, in the same house for 18 years, I don't have to think about that. But for an individual who's housing is not stable, it's a much greater barrier. So I think, um, you know, providing an opportunity for eligible citizens to register on election day means that if you happen to have moved because that's your circumstance due to economics or otherwise, that you'll be able to remedy that, you'll be able to get re-registered on election day and still have your voice. And the fact that your economic cir circumstance or your housing circumstance doesn't necessarily fit you know, as well with our voter registration system won't disenfranchise you. I agree with that. <laughs> Urban areas, this moving, moving and switching schools and all that is uh, very disruptive of these citizens' ability to access the services that we others expect. Hey, I wanted to say one more thing before we, we go. If you haven't read it, our good friend in the back who runs Pridge Magazine, uh, read this magazine, read this article about uh, how a shadow Republican group gerrymandered Michigan, sparking a backlash. I loved it. His, his reporters have really dug deep into what we thought was secret uh, rooms where we came up with this stuff. But, so it's a good magazine if you want to read about how it really happens. Thank you. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, as to marginalized communities, um, under our proposal, uh, the commission would have to abide by the Federal Voting Rights Act. That's federal law. It, it applies now. It applies uh, under this proposal. Um, and I would just say that as to all voters, including historically disenfranchised voters, they would, they would have their votes count uh, with a yes vote on proposal two. They would not be packed and cracked into different districts just because, you know, they can be reliably um, counted on to vote for one party or another. Every vote would actually count. I would give a cautionary tale. So the U.S. Supreme Court last spring issued a decision called Houston uh, after the Ohio Secretary of State. And in Ohio, this law said that if you didn't vote in an election, then a cancellation notice would be sent to you. And in that packet of material you get is a little card that you're to return if you want to stay on the file or you need to vote sometime within the next two federal elections. The NVRA, the National Voter Registration Act, says you cannot even initiate the cancellation process based on the failure to vote. Well, that's exactly what they do. And for whatever reason, the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, they don't really cancel them because of that. They cancel them because they forgot to send a little card back. Well, how many little cards do you receive in the mail that end up going in the trash, right, that you never quite get to? So what this would result in in Michigan if that were implemented here, and there have been some discussions along those lines, would be thousands and thousands of voters thrown off the rolls having no idea that it was because of this little card four years ago that they didn't respond to. Election day registration is the safety net to any of that type of activity to give people of all economic, 
situations the ability to get back on the file and vote on election day. Anyone else got a final few thoughts they want to place before the audience? I I, I did I did write once non-citizens and I circled it a few times you know as a voting rights strategist the um, the the nightmare of non-citizens is just so frustrating because I, I think as, as mr. Thomas pointed out we have a system for registering individuals right now and they're required to check a box and you know affirm their eligibility which includes that they are a citizen and perhaps I just need to say affirmatively proposal 3 is not going to allow citizens to become registered there's nothing about proposal 3 that allows sorry non-citizens that allows non-citizens to become registered um, but and no voting right advocate I've ever met is advocating for non-citizens who don't have a right to vote under you know state law here in Michigan to be able to register and vote but it is the boogeyman it is the it is the nightmare that's thrown out there no matter what proposal you put forward I'm sure if it had been the talking point back when motor voter was adopted here in Michigan it would have been the argument for why we do shouldn't have motor voter it is just the argument no matter whether you're adopting the most basic thing that every state already has or you're adopting something new and novel and none of the things in proposal three are new and novel they've all been adopted in other states and their voting system is not falling down full of illegal citizens on the voter registration rolls so it's just very disappointing that that's always the argument regardless of whether it has any basis in reality and that includes kansas kansas <laughs> yes kansas has to. Yes. So Kansas has also adopted reforms, uh, even though they have the individual who's most concerned with non-citizens, obsessed, might some, some might say, with non-citizens. Okay, well, that brings our panel to a close. I hope you'll join me in thanking the panelists. And I hope you'll join us in a reception outside in the Great Hall, outside of the auditorium. If you'd like to talk to one of the panelists uh, about a point, we suggest you find them out in the Great Hall because we're going to be taking equipment down and otherwise getting in the way in here. So thank you all for coming, and uh, we look forward to talking to you outside. <laughs>